So hi there, and welcome to another episode of Insights with Net Support. My name is Mark Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at ICT Evangelist. But more importantly, you can hit that subscribe button. And uh, if you like what you hear on these shows, uh, we try and keep you updated with lots of insights from interesting people right across the education space. And uh, as with all of our episodes, I've got another fantastic guest lined up for you to share some and that we'll be developing into the future so um give me great pleasure to introduce uh, dr alexandra gray on to the show welcome uh alex how are you doing today i'm good thank you thank you so much for having me uh, no, you're very, very welcome. I uh, I loved our conversation back along. And so it was, it was so, um, I thought it was really, um, you know, the things you're doing, the experiences you've had and the product you've been developing as well. Uh, um, I thought it'd be really interesting for others to hear about and learn about. Um, but so before we dive into all that and the other questions I've got lined up for you, could you share a little bit about who you are and um, what it is that you do, please? Yeah, so um, I come from a background in higher education, so very much um, had a whole other career in the university sector, um, interested in sort of research around human psychology and behaviour. And uh, about 10 years ago, made the switch to working in the alternative provision sector um, and worked for one alternative provision that had uh, started out life as an unregistered alternative provision. And then during the course of my time with them as a senior leader, sort of went through the process of registering to become an independent special school. So very much got to see how alternative provisions work from both the kind of unregistered and then registered and therefore offset inspected end of things. And I've been really, really lucky in my career to work across the entire spectrum. So I've done lots of consulting and training in pupil referral units, lots of consulting and training in units in mainstream school where um, behaviour is a particular issue and, and schools are sort of setting up their own on-site alternative provision. So really I had a chance to work across the entire sector um, over the mm. last 10 years or so. And what I'm working on now is um, through my own company, developing sort of technological solutions to resourcing the sector. So um, particularly at the moment, LearnTrek is our um, management information system designed specifically for APs. Um, and that's really out of a desire for finding ways to help alternative provisions to recognise the successes of children for whom progress just looks and feels a little bit different than the mainstream. And that's really driven by a strong sense of kind of social justice around, you know, these children absolutely deserve to have their um, achievements recognised, even if the technology that's out there isn't necessarily always geared towards doing that. So um, that's that's an, an amazing project to be working on and what I'm mostly focusing on now, but still do the odd bit of consultancy work and training on the behaviour management side of things. Um, I'm very much able to keep my hand in the alternative provision world through the many, many clients that we work with, um, with the LearnTrek system. So, so it's been great. Cool. Well, I'll, I'll dive more deeply into LearnTrek and, and how it came, came to be and things. I think your story uh, is really interesting and uh, I'd love to sort of get a share about that in a little while. But talking about alternative provision, what, what's the landscape? It's, it's, I, I've had the um, pleasure and, and the upset of, of working uh, in alternative provision a, a number of times in my career and it, it's hard work, right? Uh, so could, could you share a little bit about what the landscape um, is, is like? in terms of alternative provision and um, what some of the challenges are perhaps you, you might have faced whilst, whilst working in that setting? So there's been some pretty um, big shifts. So I joined the sector around um, as a senior leader, at least in sort of 2015, 2016. And at that time, um, there was considerable concern um, from government around the issue of unregistered schools, um, illegal schools operating, a lot of them faith schools, um, that were kind of under the radar and operating in ways that um, were, were of great concern, um, particularly to the Department for Education. So I sort of came in off the back of those concerns into um, a, a situation where 
the, the sector sort of split into two or three different um, channels. You had your people referral units, which were, uh, you know, the maintained, um, the most kind of regulated version of alternative provision. Um, and then you had this option that other APs had where they could either register to become independent special schools and go down the kind of the route of being offset inspected, or they could decide to stop offering full time provision and just offer sort of 18 hours or less. Um, and so there was quite a big split around that time, 2015, 2016. And I was in an AP who made the decision, quite quite a difficult decision, I think, to register as an independent special school and go through that process of becoming, I suppose, quite a lot more mainstream and, and certainly more mainstream than they would have would have liked, I think. Um, and and that was one route that, that, that kind of happened then. Um, but on the other side of things, lots of alternative provisions decided to... Um, provide less contact hours and sort of stay under that 18 hour limit um, and sort of developed um, as the kind of demand increased for these sorts of placements, these external provisions, um, more and more of them have kind of come along to, to fill that gap. Um, and then in 2023, uh, March this year, we've had the SEND and AP inclusion plan, which has changed the landscape again. Um, and that has sort of set out um, the need for a set of national standards, again, around concern that some of these provisions are operating in ways that perhaps um, aren't as good as they should be. And um, very much a focus on unregistered provision, which I think is a bit of a misnomer, really. And I, I, I sort of take issue with this a little bit because the um, unregistered provisions that I work with are very, very professional and providing just amazing um, opportunities for children and young people. And when we talk about them being unregistered, it just means they're not offset inspected in the same way that a maintained um, provision like a people referral unit would be. Mm. It doesn't mean that they're operating completely off the radar. Quite often they're subject to really stringent local authority inspections. There is plenty of oversight, usually from governing boards um, and if they're charities, um, you know, boards of trustees. So so they, I think they get quite a bad reputation. There's this real kind of negative encoding of the language around um, unregistered, where actually we see so much innovation um, happening in these unregistered provisions because they don't. Um, they don't have to work to quite the same um, types of targets. And I don't want to say the same standards because I think the standards in lots of unregistered APs are really high, but they're not um, having to work in the same way that uh, mainstream schools or maintained alternative provisions do. And that, I think, frees up a level of flexibility. What the 2023 Send and, Inclusion, uh, Send and AP Improvement Plan is effectively um, saying is that there needs to be a set of national standards developed for alternative provisions, even if they are delivering um, under the 18 hours. And I think that's really welcome. I think most people that work in the sector think that's a great idea, um, as long as it's developed with those alternative provisions and there is there's decent consultation around that and that's hinted at in the plan that that's likely to involve Ofsted. So there might be a slightly different inspection framework for unregistered AP, which is likely to make people feel a little bit uneasy. Having said that, my experience of, of being often inspected on a number of occasions in alternative provision has, has largely been really positive. Um, so I don't think there's quite as much to fear as, as people think. There is definitely a sense in the plan that um, the the kind of gold standard of alternative provision should be um, that that schools and local authorities are developing their own internal alternative provisions. That 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 sort of idea of having units within schools where children are accessing something slightly different is where the sector should be moving to. And I fundamentally think that is is um, potentially really problematic um, because I think that part of the reason that external alternative provision works as well as it can sometimes do for the students for, for whom it really does work is that it isn't school, is that it doesn't look and feel like school, that actually it is a fresh start. It's not on school grounds. It's not with school staff. And so I'm not convinced by this sort of push towards um, head teachers and local authority send offices developing their own internal provision, um, partly to do with resourcing and expertise and, and how that would work with already very busy head teachers having to try and resource that. But also whether or not one of the fundamental things that makes external alternative provision work as well as it does is the fact that it is external. Um, so, so that has been that's a big shift in the landscape, um, and I think that yeah. one failures in the consultation process around this is, to, is for the Department for Education to really understand the, the value that external AP can bring as well as the challenges. I think it's kind of come from this quite negative place that unregistered must mean 
you know, loose cannon, um, you know, unaccountable and somehow less Wild than. West. Yeah, and I, I really feel like we, you know, I work with a lot of alternative provisions across up and down the country and across the sector and everything from, you know, the guy in a field who's a one man band doing equine therapy all the way up to the kind of independent special schools. And nobody gets into the sector to play fast and loose with children's education. You know, the people there are very professional and very passionate. Um, and so actually, you know, the, the fact that this, this plan is coming from a place of uh, an assumption that somehow unregistered AP is less than, I think is potentially problematic. And as long as that can be reframed in the work that goes forward with the kind of consultation work that's happening around developing the national standards, I think that can only be a really positive thing. No, I, th I think you're absolutely right there. One of the things that sort of strikes me when, when I think about children who have you know additional needs, whatever they are, part of the solution is thinking about their accommodations. And for many for many young people, they do struggle with the idea of school and their structure around it and all those different things. And so, accommodating sometimes actually means about actual accommodation, doesn't it? It's not mm. just about the you know, piece of technology they might need or whatever. It's sometimes it's about the building, the structure of the day all those sort of things. I can definitely see how those sort of things could be problematic for a, a, a large section of our young people, or young person society. You did mention, Alex, in, in, um, in, in what you were sharing there about how some of these um, sort of unregistered provisions uh, do facilitate more sort of innovation. Have you got any yeah. examples that, that, that um, you could share with us that might be helpful yeah. for other people? Yeah, I think one of the big areas of innovation that we have encountered, and this is not coming from me as a kind of person who's interested in the tech side, this is about people who are on the ground with children, young people with extremely challenging behaviour and very high needs. Curriculum is the big thing. When I um, when we were going through the process of registering to become an independent school in the AP that I worked in, we looked at other APs who we're not using the national curriculum, we tried to find some and there weren't that many out there. By and large, pupil referral units were still using the national curriculum. And even when we found places that were doing something a little bit different, it tended to be that they were delivering national curriculum subjects at perhaps much lower levels or in quite innovative ways. But there were very few alternative provisions that had bespoke curricula. Um, and that was sort of back in 2016. Now, that's just not the case anymore. What's happened is a real explosion in the last seven or eight years of um, thinking outside the box in terms of curriculum. And I do think the new Ofsted framework that's come in in recent years has helped to enable that because Ofsted are inspecting in a slightly different way that is allowing, mm. as long as um, progress can be shown from the student starting point, allowing a little bit more flexibility in terms of the way it looks at alternative provision so perhaps that's been a factor but we see um small you know relatively new um alternative provisions setting up um in and having these kind of really innovative approaches to curriculum by thinking what do our students need what is there what are, are there opportunities post school and um, post compulsory education what does that pathway look like and actually in many ways they're being more innovative in terms of thinking about what the jobs of the future are going to be, what the opportunities of the future are going to be in a much more kind of technical world than the one that perhaps you or I might have matriculated into. Um, in some ways, I see that as being, you know, cutting edge, really, compared to what mainstream education settings are having to deliver, um, mm. obviously, because they are, um, you know, the, the education system, mainstream education is a juggernaut, you know, it takes a long time to turn something like that and to make changes and it's it's disruptive and difficult some of these very small flexible provisions are able to do some really di different interesting things because they're so small because they um quite often have students who are disapplied from the national curriculum and therefore there is an assumption that they are not going to be entered for gcse's so those settings are thinking hang on a minute okay what can they achieve what are the opportunities what mixture of kind of academic and vocational type opportunities can we put together and so we see these incredibly um bespoke curricula coming together um in ways that are, are just amazing and didn't exist i think five six seven years ago when i was going out there looking at what was what was being delivered in alternative provisions there just seems to be have been a massive um, growth in this area 
Uh, that's really interesting. I, I love the fact that you've actually talked about innovation, which hasn't involved any technology at all. Um, so <laughs> a, lot of our, a lot of our conversations before have been talking about the ways in which you can use tech to make things more accessible for learners and, and to help them integrate and, and all these different things. So I love the fact you're sharing about curriculum rather than technology. But moving on to technology, um, so you, you were t tasked um, with the idea of trying to find an MIS for your provision, mm -hmm. weren't you? And yeah. you, you, you had a few problems which led to you then doing something innovative yourself. Could you share a little bit about that, that, that sort of story and, and how that sort of came about and, and then what you did about that and, and where it led to you to where you are today? So, yeah, and this has really determined the trajectory of my kind of professional life in a way that I never could have really predicted because I was asked as part of the leadership team that were preparing the um, organisation I was in for school registration to look for an MIS. We had been existing on so many spreadsheets up until that point and I know that's where a lot of small provisions are still um, because there wasn't an awful lot out in the sector for us so we looked at some of the um, market leaders and, and they were great the things that they do are, are brilliant they do what they do really really well and there's definitely now more choice than there was back then um, you know I've been looking at some really great products lately and just thinking uh, you know that has moved on so significantly but in 2017 we couldn't find anything that really tracks progress for our students so thinking about that innovative innovative curricula the idea that actually it wasn't going to be national curriculum subjects it wasn't going to be standardized testing how do we track progress when progress is the difference between you know refusing to let the mentor in the front door versus having a conversation where you're being told to f off through the bedroom door that is progress for a lot of our students that's what that looks like and we needed to find ways of breaking that down recognizing it tracking it celebrating it but also um communicating it to funders parents and, and other stakeholders as well as the child and young person themselves to show them how much they could, could progress and we just couldn't find anything on the market that did it um, what the closest we got, I think, was that we found if we bought um, a large scale MIS and then bought several kind of things that plugged into it, several kind of integrations, um, something to track curriculum progress, something for safeguarding, um, something that did kind of payments and things, we could sort of get maybe 40% of what we're wanting to track, 40% um, of our, our ridiculous uh, sea of spreadsheets, could we could kind of get it in, but it never felt like a comfortable fit and the cost was just really prohibitive. So it didn't feel like that was a really good option for a small setting that had about 50 students at the time. So it sort of sent me on a path of thinking, okay, it doesn't exist. I'm, I'm going to see if I can build it. Um, so I got involved with a very friendly developer who I happen to be married to. Um, who uh, helped sort of talk all of this out. And it was a really, really big project between the school senior leadership team um, in the AP that I was in and the, the developer to try and produce something that would do this. And it's it started off as a kind of series of metrics around attendance and behaviour, but very fast became a system that would run our entire organisation, including our, all of our safeguarding and our compliance stuff, all of our reporting. So really, um, we just wanted to be able to track uh, progress. And we sort of ended up with a product that would allow a small alternative provision um, or, or independent school to actually run pretty much everything that they do without the kind of cost of having to buy something in that's very expensive that only perhaps did half of what needed to be done. Um, so that that's how Learn Trek came about and certainly hadn't realised quite what um, interest there would be from other small alternative provisions. So the idea of it ever being a kind of viable business where we could um, support other alternative provisions and really um, help um, in the sector um, and help work towards getting to a point where um, those provisions could actually meet a set of national standards because there would be the evidence of what they were doing. Um, that that's been that was a dream a while ago and now actually it, it, you know it, it's out there and it's working and we've got some great alternative provisions that we're working with but we're always adapting we're always changing I guess we're of a size where that is possible where it is possible to do things that are really bespoke to those individual settings and that's about recognizing that those children are very individual and what meets their needs is different from one place to the next 
Thank you for sharing that, Alex. And so I, when you were talking to me about this, say, back, back a little while ago, I was really struck by, um, you know, say the innovation and, and what you're doing with it, but the, the way in which you, you, you've done it in response, like, like many sort of educational entrepreneurs, in response to a, a need uh, in, in the place that you're working. I'm just, just wondering, um, uh, without giving away any intellectual property, obviously, but uh, <laughs> could you, could you um, sort of give me a uh, highlight, a particular example of how, of how um, your learn track um, MIS sort of differs from, um, I'd say, many I could pick a name of, I won't pick one, but we, we know who the sort of the big players are. <coughs> how, how is it that, that, that LearnTrack actually differs? I mean, you've talked about how um, progress might look different for some students, mm -hmm. not in your usual sort of curricular kind of way. Can you give me some examples, perhaps, yeah. sort of, of what makes your sort of stand out compared to what you might find in a sort of more mainstream setting? So I think that there are two big ones. One is around attendance and one is around curriculum. Um, the obvious one is attendance because um, many mainstream settings um, will require input around is this child there? Are they present, not present? And if they're not present, what, what's the reason they're not present? So are they ill or is it unauthorised absence? That sort of thing. And for a lot of systems, that's where it stops. What was really important to us was to find um, lots of different ways of tracking attendance. And so the system allows users to choose which attendance metrics they want to, to use but there are quite a broad range that mm -hmm. um, really recognize that for our children and young people attendance is just very different from whether they've turned up or not so a lot of our settings um, work in the community um, so attendance on site in school is not really um, the thing that they are working towards it's more about attending within the community and um, having ways of tracking that that weren't just about whether they were on school grounds or not was really important so we've got a kind of range of metrics that track not just whether the child is present but in what way they're present um, and so that might be um, you know giving a kind of numerical value to the types of attendance so for example if you have a child who um, doesn't attend but actually an awful lot of work is going on to contact the family do welfare checks engage with the student where possible that all needs to be tracked as some progress because actually if you've had a family that were not engaging at all and you're able to have a series of phone calls that in of itself might represent some real progress for that child or for that family right the way through to a kind of high numerical value for the absolute pinnacle which for some settings will be attendance on site but for others might be you know distance learning or some kind of event in the community or working in the student's home so it's kind of about um building a range of metrics so that our um, users could choose how they wanted to track attendance in just just beyond this idea that the the absolute be all and end all in education is about being on school grounds in a classroom when the classroom might be you know in the outdoors and and that's perfectly fine so there are a range of different ways of doing that as five or six different attendance metrics and we're always growing them so we always um come across new ones that people are using and it generally comes in a really organic way from someone who's been quite innovative in their own setting and built a spreadsheet <laughs> which is doing something really interesting um you know whether it's a rag rating or a, a numerical value or they've come up with a, a way of representing that in a bar graph and they come to us and they say we're, we're tracking attendance like this how how can you build something for us that will allow us to show that as a line on a graph or, or a chart? Um, so what's really interesting to us is, is tracking that sort of non-linear progression where attendance is going up and down um, and it's not always a straight line. Um, there are lots of different ways of showing that. And actually, if what you're tracking is just one way on a graph, that's not going to give you the full picture of how that child might be improving in the background. Um, so that's that's one example. Our curriculum feature is another really nice example, all of those innovative curricula that all of our clients have come up with um, and that we're kind of aware of from working in the sector. We had to find a way of allowing everybody to track that. So whether or not it's a syllabus or it's an actual qualification, um, you're, um, you're able to upload that onto the system. And what we really focus on is breaking everything down into tiny, tiny steps. So um, the lots of systems allow you to kind of put learning outcomes on and, and track, um, you know, to the extent to which those learning outcomes have been reached and to put sort of assessment grades in. What we have allowed our clients to do is to take every learning outcome and potentially break them down into tiny, tiny steps um, so that those tiny units of progress that don't seem like progress to the naked eye, that don't seem like progress to anyone who's from a kind of mainstream teaching background, because actually, ultimately, the learning outcome hasn't been met. 
um, we can break down the tiny, tiny components within the system that, that make up the full learning outcome. So, for example, I'm thinking about functional skills and um, maths where, you know, there's a learning outcome there at one of the levels that says read, order and compare. What can often happen for students is they're going to stumble on that because they can't do all three of those things. So this system is very much about breaking down the read, order and compare components, breaking those down if that's necessary so that those tiny, tiny steps forwards and backwards can be recorded. And for our students, what that often looks like is two steps forward and three backward, but that's still progress. It doesn't look like progress on a traditional graph, but it is progress. So we've been very, very invested in making sure that our curriculum tracking features allows a setting to upload its entire curriculum, whether or not that is a kind of formal qualification, a formal mm -hmm. syllabus, or just what do you want your students to achieve? What, what is your kind of focus and your goal in your setting? And then what are the smallest component pieces that, that comprise that goal? How do we show progress, even if just turning up is, is a massive element of that? Um, and I think a lot of settings, uh, a lot of systems don't really track at that minuscule level um, because the assumption is that most students are at a certain level in order to be able to attend a mainstream setting. Well, it definitely sounds like something that uh, I'm sure lots of alternative provisions uh, and schools uh, who work with uh, who are outside of mainstream would be interested in, in learning more about. It sounds like actually for some schools where they got in you know, alternative provision on site as well, perhaps something worth considering finding out more about as well. So thank you for sharing about all of that, Alex. I, I wanted to dive uh, before we sort of say goodbye um, into because uh, the shows insights i want to try and sort of pull a few more sort of secrets out because i say in, in previous conversations <laughs> i've had with you and some of the things i've read from you you shared lots of ideas <coughs> uh, and uh, resources and tools and apps and all these different things uh, that can be helpful to teachers and young people so uh, my, my sort of final question for you um, in our conversation today is what are the secrets to success with young people in alternative provisions as i've quite a broad uh thing so if you could sort of turn that in and condense that into uh, a few helpful hints and tips say we could be here all day trying to unpick the all the secrets uh but um what would be your sort of main piece of advice around uh, being successful with young people in, in these sorts of settings i think at this at the leadership level particularly the culture is really important where I have seen alternative provisions work incredibly well with the most challenging um, cohorts of students who in all other settings have, have kind of had horrendous behaviour incidents. Where I've seen it work really, really well is where there is a culture of openness and re reflective practice. So I think if you don't have a reflective culture where leaders and others can challenge each other and try and say, oh, hang on a minute, that doesn't seem quite right. Can we talk about that? Um, I think it enables a level of safeguarding. So I think if things aren't getting swept under the carpet, that really, really helps um, to have a culture where you can say, oh, actually, how could that have gone a little bit better? Um, and in as nice a way as possible, being willing to be challenged is, is a big, important part of that. So for leaders, I think that's absolutely vital that working with this cohort of students that come bring with them, you know, quite a lot of um, challenges. Um, there is a tendency to try and, um, you know, sweep things under the carpet and hope that nobody notices when things go wrong. Whereas I think actually having a really open culture is really, really important for that. I think on the ground, consistency. So I think it's better to keep things simple and have just a few simple rules um, than to kind of have, uh, you know, really, really complicated um, behaviour and reward systems, really, really complicated um, systems of uh, consequences and sanctions. I think that rules and structure are incredibly important. And there's a real assumption in alternative provision that it's all just about meeting the needs of the student and just doing really good pastoral work and, you know, just accepting that they come from um, often you know really difficult backgrounds that we have to make allowances i don't think that's the case i think that um rules and structure and consistency are just as important and in, in you know possibly more important for those sorts of students and so um keeping it simple allows you the maximum possible chance as a leader that your team are going to be able to deliver that um, so I think that, you know, if you're thinking about creating a kind of really good culture around behaviour and trying to um, work with these sorts of students, what you really need to do is look at your systems and try and keep them incredibly simple so that they can be clearly communicated to staff and to students. And where I see this going wrong is when you walk into settings where they've got, you know, 
10 or 15 rules that students and staff are supposed to remember um, that, that you know don't necessarily cover all sorts of instances. And I think on the other side of this, um, you know, I, I saw a great tweet from a guy called Ben Carlin. I think he's Ben Carlin one, his Twitter handle, recently, who kind of gave a really, really nuanced account of this, this issue with the debate around is behaviour management about um, meeting the needs of students or is it about structure and rules? And he kind of said, this is this is two sides of the same thing, right? In order to meet the needs of students, you need to have structure and rules and consistency and you, you need to not just be focusing on meeting the needs of students um, to, you know, to the point where your own needs as an educator and the needs of the other 20, 30 kids in your classroom are, are just, you know, thrown out of the window. And so sometimes that's about recognising that in a teaching environment, you can't be the one doing everything you can't be the one meeting the needs of that really disruptive pupil it's about thinking about when where and who is appropriate to meet those needs and that's about having really good systems around delivering education that interact with really good systems around the kind of pastoral side of things in the education setting so where i see this working incredibly well in alternative provisions is where some real thought has gone into it's not two different camps you can be incredibly responsive to the needs of students but that might involve removing them from a classroom setting and getting them some help um, from some other part of your system um, you know, that is not about refusing to acknowledge that they have needs um, that need to be met. That is about being pragmatic in terms of who, when and how those needs are met. And as I say, the, if I have a look at it, the, the tweet is quite recent um, from Ben Carlin, who I think just does a really good job of kind of picking apart the nuance of those potentially competing issues that I think are just two sides of the same thing. So from a kind of leadership perspective, consistency, reflective culture, and really understanding that actually it's not about deciding whether you're a kind of trauma-informed needs-oriented provision or whether you are kind of very focused on bums and seats and classrooms and lots of structure and lots of rules. Actually, you need to make sure those two things are working together really well. So that those would be my kind of key recommendations for what success looks like in alternative provision. Brilliant stuff. Thank you so much, Alex. And uh, I'm a big fan of the whole keeping it simple thing. So uh, we're at the end of the episode. Uh, listen, uh, really enjoyed all the insights from you, Alex. You've shared so many great things. That Ben Carling tweet, we'll find that and we'll pop that into the show notes so people can refer back to it. Um, if you want to follow Alex on social media, you can do so. She's grey uh, with an A, Hewis uh, on Twitter. Uh, the website is www.hewistechnologies.com. And if you want to find out about Trek, just add slash learn trick on the end uh, but for now uh, thank you very much uh, indeed for joining me on insights with net support please do hit that subscribe button and i look forward to you joining us in a future episode of insights with net support thank you very much uh, dr alexandra gray and thank you to you uh, for listening we'll see you on the next episode take care everybody and stay safe out there bye bye